At the final meeting of the Clinton Global Initiative in New York City, I met with Injadeka to talk about bridging the digital gap for young people. I heard you speak, and, and what I really liked uh, that you said, and I want you to talk a little bit about this, is that you, you said uh, we don't have a cookie cutter approach. And I think that's, that's a trap people fall into. This is working here. Let's take it. Let's duplicate it here. So what is the philosophy behind that, that you don't get caught up in that trap? Absolutely. You know, I truly believe in the in the saying, you know, you should not necessarily reinvent the wheel. Absolutely. But in our space, working in this uh, social enterprise space where we are co-designing and developing programs with the communities we work in, it's very important that we understand fundamentally what the community's needs are. So we start with people, not technology. We start with the people co-designing programs that use appropriate technology to drive their communities forward. And we've always had that methodology with our, our design approach um, in all our programs. And it's important particularly because we can't um, take just an approach where we come down and we say, here, here's our program, run with it. Individuals have to have a vested interest in the program delivery and most importantly, the outcome. And they have to be able to understand and see how that outcome affects their livelihoods and it has to be clear from day one. So in all the communities that we invest in, we start with the people, we coordinate and organize focused group discussions where they share with us what their concrete needs and realities are. Together we co-develop programs using appropriate technology that meet those needs. And so that's really what we have done. You know, in our space in Nigeria, we look mostly at the issue of uh, the skills gap as well as the mis mismatch in terms of the transition between education and employment. So we work with the private sector. We have several private sector partners that we work with where we're asking the question, what skills are you looking for? What skills are you getting? And what's the mismatch that exists? We also work with the education community to understand what are the challenges with transitioning, uh, transitioning students from education to the world of work. By getting the voice of the customer, the voice of the people that we intend to serve, we're able to co-design programs that best meet the needs to fulfill some of these gaps. So it's interesting, these gaps, uh, you, you start off with a digital divide, but there's more divides. I mean, you have to kind of, there's a lot of bridges you have to construct. Where are you at in terms of constructing bridges, would you say? You know, we've, we've only just scratched the surface, and that's what I tell my colleagues and uh, my team and then a, a lot of partners. There's so much work to do, right, in the space um, because there's so much need. Um, there's so much need with the advent of, of technology, obviously, the emerging technologies that are being introduced right now, that gap is, is widening. Um, but at the same time, there, there are other opportunities. You look at the mobile space across Africa, I mean, mobile penetration in most African countries is about 100% at this point, and you know, 2 billion people own smartphones today. And so where Africa has leapfrogged over the typical you know, desktop and PC era, to mobile phones, it's created tons of opportunity um, in, in the financial space and in the entrepreneurship and education space, but at the same time, some people are, are still being left behind. Um, so we see this, you know, in the industrial revolutions, for instance, where, you know, in the first industrial revolution, you know, a good 17% of the population is still without without power, right? There's still um, people that live without electricity in the second industrial revolution. Still 46% of the developing countries have access to the internet. And now we're in the fourth revolution where technologies like you know, 3D printing and artificial intelligence are being introduced. While there's opportunity there, um, there's still people being left behind. And so our role as an organization is how can we introduce you know, the most appropriate technology for development and ensure that in our capacity, working across multi-stakeholders, we're bringing everyone along. Injadeka completed her postgraduate studies at Stanford University. She was born in Nigeria and came to the United States to study when she was 18. She quickly realized her lack of tech skills would be a challenge. Let me ask you, uh, I've heard so much about the digital divide, but I, but I watched a video with you 
and it was interesting because you called it the digital canyon and you talked about an 18 year old coming here and how difficult it was for you so if you don't mind going back over that uh, that anecdote that story for us uh, I think that'd be a good launching pad to kind of set the stage for where you're at now sure sure great question I mean you know this concept of the digital divide has been one that has been prevalent over the years, right? Obviously, we, we didn't coin the term ourselves, but it's evident of, of the fact that there is a huge canyon between the developed and the developing world, specifically around um, education and technology. And so moving to the United States, you know, bright-eyed, 18-year-old, um, in pursuit of dreams I had as a little girl, which were to go to university, um, one of the greatest challenges for me was not so much cultural or social or economic per se, but it was really the intersection between education and technology in the university setting. That was really the aha moment, you know, having grown up and lived most of my life um, in Nigeria, West Africa. Um, my parents were professors, uh, but really coming to the U.S. and being introduced to technology in the education setting as, as such was probably my greatest surprise. And it's interesting because you said at, at age 18 there's this problem, you're kind of mulling it over, everybody else is grabbing their laptops, I guess, right? Is that, is that when you were like, oh my gosh, Absolutely. it's a different world, I'm living in a different world. Absolutely, and that was, you know, I would say my first foray into cyberspace, so to speak, you know, coming in an 18-year-old freshman into the classroom and English 101, I remember it clearly, the professor standing up in front of the class and saying, tell me about a time. And you know, everyone grabbed their keyboard and went away. And I grabbed my pen um, because that was what I, I knew and what, what, what I was familiar with and really hadn't had any exposure to technology whatsoever until coming to the United States. And it's as a result of that moment, um, really, I've lived the rest of my life since then, really trying to think about ways in which myself and, and the organization which I lead, Youth for Technology Foundation, can help to really bridge that digital gap, that digital canyon that exists. But you know what's interesting is a lot of people would take a hit like that and feel embarrassed or whatever, or just like, oh man, everybody's got it. They're ahead of me because they've got these laptops. But instead, it stayed with you and really forged the beginning of what you're doing today. Um, What's that kind of thinking? What goes on in your head to take something that mo most people would see, see as a kind of a hindrance and turn it, flip it over and say, hey, this is something, maybe I can build something uh, to help to build that bridge over right. that canyon. Absolutely. And, you know, from day one, it's, it's never been about me, but it has really been about the impact on the people that we serve. They are at a center, at the center of our mission at Youth for Technology Foundation, primarily young people living in the developing world and women, their mothers, who we also invest in and co-design programs for. Um, as an 18-year-old, you know, having graduated from university uh, here in the U.S., I began my career in corporate America, like most would. First at General Electric, um, where I really traveled all over the world in various capacities from finance to quality and M&A. And then I ended up at Microsoft and um, spent a couple of years at Microsoft. And it was really at Microsoft that my vision for Youth for Technology Foundation was born. I found myself in a place where I had access to resources and really working for you know the world's greatest software company, I felt a compelling reason to to give back, starting with the land of my birth, and to give back to young people living in developing countries that would never have an opportunity. And part of our work at, at Youth for Technology Foundation involves identifying talent. But we know that talent is relative, and talent is really based on the availability of opportunities. And so that's what we um, strive to, to help and empower the younger generation with um, that talent merged with the right opportunities to unlock really unlimited potentials. Injideka believes digital manufacturing and 3D printing will revolutionize Africa's manufacturing industry. So YTF launched 3D Africa. It combines classroom, online learning, and business development training to teach students about this new type of technology. 
And you know, given your background, uh, you know how technology changes. I mean, working with Microsoft, it's, it's, it, it's almost there's five steps, everyone has to think five steps ahead. And I know that you're already talking about 3D printing technology and, and working with that, which is obviously cutting edge. Talk to me about that work and, and what you are accomplishing there. Absolutely, you know, we're, we're extremely excited about um, the 3D printing industry at a macro level. The industry somewhere, today is at about three billion, um, but it's really projected to grow in about 2025 to about 30 billion. Um, in 2014 alone, about 133,000 3D printers were, were, were shipped globally. So the industry is huge. In our case at Youth for Technology Foundation, we are the only social enterprise really in Nigeria um, introducing 3D printing technologies at the intersection of education and entrepreneurship. We believe that these technologies allow people to invent and create the world that they, they deem fit. So whether it's um, creating small household consumables, whether it's creating um, products that they can market for sale in online markets, we believe it's huge in two ways. One for education and one for entrepreneurship. Um, girls, which is a sector that we serve, um, we have a gender bias as an organization. They like to they like to create, they like to make and invent. And 3D printing allows them to do that without necessarily feeling the pressure, particularly societal and cultural pressure about being a smarty pants, right? Liking science, liking technology, liking engineering. They create, they innovate without really knowing that they are actually implementing physics. Um, they are looking at measurements, you know, and they are looking at, at science in essence to be able to create products that are durable and can withstand the 3D printing threshold. And so this is one interesting way that we're introducing the technology. On the entrepreneurship side, we know that access to global markets can open up a whole new world for, for people, um, particularly women entrepreneurs, and we're looking at ways in which they can create their products that they market using 3D printing and then have those available to the global, global marketplace. You know, an, an example of this would be a, a woman entrepreneur we're working with in, in Aqua Ebon. And she owns a business called Afrocentric, and she um, she sells jewelry, African-based type jewelry, um, necklaces and bracelets, etc. And she's had this business since 2008. But we've recently introduced 3D printing, and she's using the technology to actually create products that she's now making available for sale to her customers, products that are customized and are Africa-centric, um, but are manufactured using this amazing technology and so it's really a very exciting time for us in the space. And what is she saying about this? I mean you must, that, that's got to be one of the things that drives you is to see these success stories and the smiles on their faces. I mean because uh, success initially may be here but but once they start to see a wider world success is much bigger isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely and success is really what drives us and the impact that we have on the students and um, the youth that we serve as well as the women that we serve um, you know just another example I remember a young girl that I recently uh, I recently met while um, I was working in, in one of our hubs in Nigeria precious and she's been designing and modeling 3d printed items she opened up her first Thinkiverse account and Thinkiverse is basically a platform for 3D printed products. So she's designing her products and she's making them available for sale on the platform and for other designers to take a look at what she's done. So in addition to actually teaching the technology, we're actually teaching the entrepreneurship side of things. We believe that it is important for these young people to not only understand the technology, but also how to monetize their talent for good. Financial inclusion is a challenge across the world, but especially in Africa. In Nigeria, as of 2017, about 70% of the adult population was financially excluded, meaning they had no access to a full-service bank. Talk to me about financial inclusion. What is that concept and what does it mean to you? Now that's great that you would bring that up because, I, as I just mentioned, you know, teaching young people and women how to monetize their talents. This is where financial inclusion is, is extremely critical. Um, at YTF Academy, we 
provide young people with the technical skills, but we also provide them with the life and entrepreneurship skills because we really believe in a well-rounded young person. In the financial inclusion space in general, in, in Nigeria, which is a country that we work in, you know, 54% of Nigerian women are still outside of the financial inclusion segment. Um, and 38% of these women uh, primarily live in, in the rural areas. And so there's still a lot of work to be done there in terms of really being able to educate and uh, teach people what it means to be financially savvy, what it means to be able to access um, you know, mobile banking and take advantage of some of those products that make banking easier. One thing for women is that they say, you know, we go into the banks and we don't see other women. Um, we don't see other women working in the bank that understand our story because for women, their life journey is completely different. And so, being able to educate these women, also we provide training um, in a partnership that we have that enables them to become mobile banking agents where they are able to train other women um, in the value chain as mobile banking agents as well so that they can access financial services more readily. Talk to me about reverse migration because I know you advocate that as well. What is it? It's keeping, you know, keeping young people in their, in their communities. Um, and why is that such a problem? Rural exodus is, is the problem, yeah. right? And so how do we create um, opportunities for young people in the communities that we serve, whether it's Wakiso in, in Uganda where we work in, uh, whether it's in Nairobi in Kenya where we work in, how can we ensure that they are staying in those communities um, instead of going out into more of the, of the urban areas um, and add into the vices there, whether it's you know the vices of, of poverty mostly associated with unemployment and crime. How can we create enabling environments in those rural communities? And one way we can do that is through through education, and by providing this education so that young people know that they can actually build within their communities, um, they can create sustainable businesses that are supported by the entrepreneurship ecosystem, they can hire local people from those communities to work there and they can really, you know, build their lives out in those communities. This is one thing that we we fundamentally believe in very strongly and we, we place a lot of emphasis on that because we believe that rural communities are very important to the overall development. Speaking of development, uh, I guess when you're in your field where things continue to change, I mean we live in this evolving world, What's your vision for the future? I mean, what type of projects are you looking at and, and how far ahead do you have to stay uh, to compete with the, this ever-changing uh, technological world that we live in? Right, I mean, things have changed. When we started Youth for Technology Foundation 15 years ago, you know, it was about you know, how do we make desktop PCs available and accessible to everyone around the world? Well, that has changed, of, of course, significantly. It's not so much about the PC, but it's about access to platforms, whether that's you know, tablet devices, whether that's mobile phones, and how do you make information readily available. Fundamentally, we believe that access to technology is a basic human right. And we still hold true to that, but that technology has evolved over time. Um, you know, it's evolved through the different revolutions, like I explained earlier, and it has really evolved. So it's about thinking ahead what technologies are evolving in the market marketplace and not just what technologies but which ones are really appropriate for the work that we do which ones are really appropriate um, for the communities that we serve and how best can we introduce those technologies into the market what puts a smile on your face i mean is it just meeting some of these people who are success stories is it uh, seeing where they could be 10 15 years from now it really is just interacting with our clients. It's interacting with these young people that we work with, interacting with their mothers who are the economic backbone of the communities that we serve. It's seeing the impact of our work on their lives, on their communities, and you know, really on the world, and how this is really changing the world for good. Injadeka, thanks so much. Thank you.